Hey, y'all, thank you for coming back tonight. I, I, you're probably, you know, this is two weeks in a row. This is Sunday morning and tonight, so you're probably, I understand if you're a little tired of me, if it will encourage you, I'm a little tired of myself as well. So I'm, you, you know, I, but I am glad we're talking about these things that are of concern to you. you. You probably wrote in about 30, 35 questions. And I want to tell you that we're not going to answer, you're going to see me fly through some of these, not because they're, uh, they don't deserve a longer answer, but I realize they may not all be equally interesting to you, so we'll plant a seed that will grow, hopefully, the rest of your life. But I am grateful that we're talking about all these things that y- you have said are causing some degree of stress in your life. I read this week um, uh, in the news that uh, among 13 to 18 year olds uh, in the past year, overdoses are up 119% and, and uh, anxiety is up 94%, depression is up 84%. So, you know, the one thing that we've learned during uh, the, the, the lockdown is that uh, you cannot shut down a country without, without inflicting major damage to the community to which you belong of of, of, of young people. So uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful and I respect uh, what you're going through. Some of the questions you say there may not exactly relate to depression, but they do relate to uh, something that's blocking you from being able to move on to some peace and uh, there are large questions. The first question of the Q&A tonight is, who is God? And that question definitely is sort of basically easy to answer because society has always agreed on who is God, and, and that is uh, God is the, is the most con- the con- conceivably the greatest force there is. It doesn't matter for 6,000 years of human history, everybody has agreed on whoever is the strongest and whoever is the wisest is by necessarily is by necessarily God. So there is an agreement on civilization, whoever is if somebody is stronger than the strongest, then he would by necessarily be God. God by nature also has to be um, immaterial, has to be a spirit being because uh, God by nature has to fill all things. And if there was a limitation to his size, uh, to his space, he would, he would not be God. Uh, I think we're in agreement uh, in, the, in the world that the... There is so much evidence in this world of des- uh, uh, for design. We would say that God is, by definition, the designer. I think we would also agree in this world by saying that uh, God is the ultimate moral law giver. Um, if we said there is not an ultimate moral law giver, then it would be impossible for you to ever say in your life, I'm offended that wrong was done to me. Whenever you say, hey, Dude, chick, that was wrong. What you're saying in that moment is, I appeal to some law above me, and you just violated that law. So if there's not an ultimate law giver, then you can never say wrong was done to you. You are appealing to ultimate law. So we know that God is the greatest of all beings by definition. Uh, He is uh, immaterial. He is spirit because he has to feel all things. If there was a place he didn't feel, then he wouldn't be God. Uh, he can have no beginning. Uh, can't be. He has to be uncaused. Uh, he is a moral lawgiver. Uh, he's a designer. And uh, one other definition I would say of God is um, this is not something we universally agree on, but it is something that we as Christians believe that we believe that uh, this God that I just described is personal and knowable and loving. Now, one of the questions you asked toward the end of the meeting was, uh, why is there so much pain and suffering in this world? And uh, I, I'll get to that in, in a moment. I just want to go ahead and, and say that the God that we worship that's personal and knowable and loving is a God that has made it clear from the beginning, has decided to achieve his eternal purposes through pain and suffering given because of human uh, choice and human responsibility. We have a God who entered into our pain in Jesus Christ and a God who said, I will eliminate all pain in heaven. So that is the definition of who is God, and that will be my longest answer of the evening. Um, This is a triple question. Why is it so hard to get out of depression? How do you deal with anxiety? I think I have undiagnosed uh, depression, social anxiety. Sometimes I feel like it's just a black hole sucking me down. So let me start with the third one first. Uh, If you are a person of social anxiety, 
Um, how do you address that? Let me just say this. Uh, you probably don't know this, but most everybody in this room suffers from social anxiety. Um, my wife will speak in just a minute on a question of parenting. I'm sure that she would say, I don't really prefer to do that tonight. We all have some degree of social anxiety. Most of the people that you look at and say, oh, they're extroverts and this is easy. It's not. I am by, naturally, by nature not an extrovert, but it's just part of who I'm called to be, to be out publicly. But this is always a challenge for me every week. The other thing I want to say about social anxiety is you are in an unbelievably difficult time of life called middle school and high school, and you're surrounded by some mean people and some weird people. And so social anxiety is a part of being a middle schooler and a high schooler. And I just have good news for you. You're not around those people the rest of your life. It's going to get better. So this is a difficult time of life. Social anxiety is a part, a unique part of the teenage years, and it will not always last. The question that's related to this, how do, um, I think, uh, how do you deal with anxiety? How's it, uh, uh, let's see, how do you deal with anxiety? Um, well, here's how you deal with anxiety. I told you last week to live by this principle, do the next thing. So whenever you are feeling anxious, the number one thing you, you have to ask yourself, is there anything I can do to get out of this anxiety? Is there anything, the next thing, is there anything I should be doing that will, you know, will, will alleviate stress because I took care of it? All right. If not, I can't do anything about it. Then I would suggest that you live in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 25 through 33 is the greatest chapter, greatest section of Scripture um, in the Bible on anxiety, obviously the teaching of our Lord, and two things that Jesus said in there that are particularly interesting. Jesus said that the number one reason that anxiety is uh, counterproductive is that God has only given you enough strength to handle today. He said at the end of Matthew 6, tomorrow's worries will take care of themselves, which is his way of saying, I did not give you enough strength to live today and to live in tomorrow. So if you're living anxious about right now, because of tomorrow, you're giving away all of today's strength for tomorrow, and it's a sure, guaranteed way to dip down into discouragement. It's self-defeating. Another reason that you need to live in Matthew chapter 6 is because you need to be reaffirmed of the character of God in Matthew chapter 6 where God said, I take care of the bumblebees, I take care of the flowers, I clothe nature, and if I do that, then you are so much more important than the birds and the flowers. Trust me. So one way to get out of anxiety is you must learn to articulate. You've got to say it. It's got to come off your lips. God, I believe you are trustworthy. If you, if you don't say that to God, it doesn't work. You've got to read Matthew chapter 6. I take care of the flowers. I take care of the bees. And I'll take care of you. So you say, God, I believe you're trustworthy. I think you need to live in in chapters like Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good. You either believe that or you don't. Listen, for we know that in all things, God works for the good. So again, you have to articulate that to the Lord. I believe you are working this evil thing, this hard thing, this painful thing for Good. You've got to say that to him. It's how you handle anxiety. You've got to articulate your pain to God. You've got to develop your trust muscles. Uh, the first question up there was, why is it so hard to get out of depression? And I think I'd like to answer this question by hurting your feelings. It's so hard to get out of depression <clears throat> because you've fallen into a habit of being depressed now, I told you last week, I have a lot of, I have personal experience with depression, uh, have seen counselors um, at different points of my life, men in my life who've served counselor, professional counselors, spoken with my doctor on occasion about that. So I'm being just as hard on myself as I am hard on you. But 
if you have not exercised in a while physically, and you're laying around on the couch all the time, the hardest thing to do is to say, I'm going to get off the couch and I'm going to go to the gym. But the only way to re-enter the world of exercise is to learn, get out of the habit of staying on that couch. So there's something that you, you have to say is, I have to do something positive to get out of depression. Lisa will tell you that the one thing she appreciates about me as, as her husband and a guy who she's pulled for during those dark times is that my, my time in a depressed valley is short. And we call it the trough. The, when I'm at the bottom of the trough and life is dark, I force myself to do something to get out of that habit of of a bad day or a bad, of a bad two days. Um, you have to, listen, in our home, if you came and lived at our house, and any of you are welcome to do that, but if you came and lived at our house, you, you would see there is sort of a party atmosphere in our house. We laugh, we play, we do goofy things. We look for every conceivable mercy drop of pleasure, like right now today, we were we were laughing at this little remote control or you know, vacuum cleaner that goes around the house by itself, and today it got stuck under one of the pieces of furniture, and we felt sorry for him, and we took him out and cleaned it out. And so these are the kind of things you have to do to get out of depression. You have to find small mercy drops of pleasure, and rejoice in anything that God would give you. That is. That is virtuous. One last thing about getting out of depression. It is not a one-time thing. Like say, okay, God, cure me. And he says, nope. What did Jesus say? Take up your cross, how many times? Daily. So cross-bearing is a daily thing. Getting out of depression is a daily plan. If you are prone, you have depressive tendencies, then you have a plan. Daily, I'm going to fight for joy. It's, listen, there's, if, if God doesn't totally remove depressive tendencies from you, and it's likely that he will not, example, there is a reason for that. God has chosen this particular cross as a means by which he's going to glorify himself through your weakness. So the reason that God does not remove depression from all people in full, in total, is that his, it's his plan to use it to work through your weakness for even your greater joy. I've had more joy in life by God bringing relief to my life than uh, than anything else. I, I want to tell you, I have, I have a little phrase, you have to live for many minis, M-A-N-Y-M-I-N-I-S, many, like a lot of minis. Live for many minis. Just look for as many mercy drops as you can in life. Look for many, tiny minis, mercy drops. It is one of the great keys to getting out of depression. How do I approach a friend who is truly depressed. Four things. Number one, verbally honor their pain. The people who've helped me the most in life are the people who did not rush to say, oh, that's nothing. Well, it actually feels like something. So don't minimize their pain by being too quick to come up with a fix-it answer. So just know that, let them know that you value their pain. You heard it. Second, ask them right there on the spot, can I pray for you? I did in the lobby today with a first-time guest. Uh, her husband was just admitted to a rehab center for COVID, and, I just, and she was very discouraged about it. I said, can I pray for you? Ask your friend, can you pray for them right then, not later, right then. Uh, number three, feel free to send them, text them scripture. You don't have to write a big letter with it. 
Uh, sometimes just take a picture. I've sent many, many pictures to people of a photograph of what I read in the Bible that day to them. Said, hey, just praying for this truth for you. And fourth, uh, be honest with them that you do not have the skills to fix them. That your relationship's going to be a lot better and a lot healthier if you play the vital role of being a friend, that your friendship is going to help them experience um, pleasures such as come over our house and we'll play cornhole, but that's the best thing I can do for you is to be a friend, but our friendship is not going to be healthy if we meet for many times to talk about depression. You are not equipped. You don't have the answer. And there, 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 there just needs to be an understanding. I've had this understanding with people. I've had this understanding with people that I've worked out with before. I said, yeah, let's work out together, but let's don't talk about this. Because I wanted to work out with them. They want to talk about that. And it sounds mean and cruel, but I realized I could not, we wouldn't get anything done if that's all we did. So find pleasures with you and your friend. That's how you're going to help them the most. Um, wow. What a question. Uh, let's see. Let's see. How do I approach a friend who's depressed when it feels like everything I say doesn't mean anything to them? I think I just sort of covered that. Uh, I'm going to say I did. Um, and... People are always saying, do not be anxious about tomorrow. How do I practically give anxiety to the Lord? I think I answered that. I trust you. I think you're working for good. Say, you know, saying that to God. Matthew 6, I trust you. You take care of birds and flowers. You'll take care of me. I trust you. I'm not going to spend time on tomorrow. I had a friend call me today, this week from out of state, and he literally said to me, I think that this particular job I applied for, I'm not going to get, and I don't know what to do if, I don't, if I'm not going to get this job. So I asked him, so just calm down. Do you know 100% you're not going to get the job? No. I said, when, when would the job offer be? Well, tomorrow. I said, is it tomorrow? No. I said, then we're, we're, we can't dedicate today's energy to tomorrow, so we're not going to live in, um, in the future. What's the best way to love LGBTQ people without supporting LGBTQ pride? I guess that would be um, a stressor in your life because of the culture in which you live. Let me make a few general statements so you'll know what we're dealing with. Whenever a society begins to depart from God, whenever a society becomes determined to rebel against the plain, obvious, creator, moral lawgiver of God, when a society enters into deep rebellion, it always results, it has in every generation, it results in a sexual rebellion. So what you're, what you're seeing right now in your culture is nothing more than society rebelling against God and it's manifested in a sexual rebellion. We're living in an age now that is anti-authority. It's just hip right now to say I'm against authority. You can't tell me what's right and what's wrong. Um, What's wrong today, if you want to know what's wrong with the social justice movement in our culture today, it is not about relieving social pains. It is an anti-authority movement. It's not about building up and solving. It is about tearing down. So we live in a tear-down, anti-authority age, which manifests itself in every generation in sexual rebellion. That's why the LGBTQ uh, movement is as strong as it is. So it's going to be difficult to make progress with your friends in this particular culture because we live in an anti-authority age that says nobody can tell me anything about what is right and wrong. It's hard. But we do want to say to imitate Jesus Christ, we do want to share the gospel with sinners. So there, we hope, we hope that God will always give the church a passion like Christ to go 
mingle with sinners. But let me tell you, for you being students, if you're going to get involved in the community and the type of things that I just discussed, you're going to have to be so super strong in your faith, so anchored to immovable, unchanging truth, or else you are going down with the movement. I had a, a pastor friend whose wife was counseling over several months uh, a woman in their church that was dealing with um, lesbianism, and they, the pastor's wife and the woman, became physically involved because so often people with the gift of mercy, when they kneel down to help somebody that is down, it is a temptation to participate in the very things that you knelt down to help them with. So you have to be, you have to be like Jesus. <laughs> Jesus could touch lepers, and that had never been done in the first century. Nobody ever touched a leper. Jesus could touch lepers, and he himself did not get leprosy. So you have to be able to mingle with sinners and not participate in their sin. And let me just share one thing with you. If you think that because of this anti-authority culture that it's just sort of hip and you think, I might experiment. I don't really have um, homosexual tendencies, but it is just so hip right now in my school to say I'm trans or whatever. Let me just say this. Be careful about you thinking it harmless to experiment with something that may not be a big pull on your life. I counseled a young person once and I said, this, this monster that you, it was not this issue, but this monster that you're dealing with is, is like right now you think you have it on a leash, you're feeding it, and you don't think that monster will ever devour you. And sure enough, uh, that young person eventually was away from God for four or five years. So don't because it's sort of hip right now, uh, it's sort of hip to like experiment. There are some things you cannot ever recover from once you start. You should never assume I can get out of a sin. And, 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 and in regard to this answer, always remember how Jesus defined, uh, how he defined love. How did Jesus define love? Jesus defined love that the woman in John chapter 8 came to him and uh, she was involved in sexual sin. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's how he defined love. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Because you're going to hear more and more from uh, this community, homosexual community, that you are judging. You're judging you're judging. And here's the terminology that you need to learn to incorporate in your language. Oh, no, no. I don't have any knowledge of what's in your heart. I'm just telling you about God's design for men and women and marriage. One woman and one man for a lifetime of marriage is God's design. So use the word, learn the word in talking design. Design, design. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you about God's design for marriage. Number whatever on this issue is dedicate serious prayer for that person. I think it's oftentimes, I think I need to go, I think I need to go, uh, you know, fix them or listen, just dedicate serious prayer and ask God to open up conversations and he will. Lisa and I had a, fr a relationship with a woman who uh, was, uh, in, uh, we had probably known her uh, probably ten, 10 years as a lesbian. And I want to tell you this, when you're dealing with somebody uh, that's involved in, in you know, any type of you know, strong sexual sin, you, as, let's just say in the LGBTQ or homosexual community, listen, the best thing that you could do is have a relationship with them 
live in such a way that your life is attractive to them. So when you do speak, but you don't have to unload all the pieces of information you've ever learned in that moment on them. You have your, you have time. So they're going to say shocking things to you to try to get you to respond in a way that you, you, you wouldn't normally. So be ready for shock questions. This, this, this girl that Lisa and I dealt with, she would, she, one of the first times I was counselor, she said, am I going to hell? And I tell her, that, that's, that's not my call. I can't, I'm not going to say whether you're going to hell. I will tell you this. If you remain in this lifestyle, because she claimed to be a believer, if you remain in this lifestyle, you'll never have any assurance about heaven. So that was my way of not being uh, roped into her thing. She wanted me to condemn her. She wanted me to judge her. I said, I'm not your judge. I just can tell you, you'll never have any assurance about salvation if you're living in perpetual sin. And this girl that uh, was a friend of Lisa's mind did come to Christ in the most unusual way that I will tell you about later. I want uh, Lisa to come up now because we're going to answer this question right here. Can parents be the cause of depression and or, and or anxiety? And I basically want to answer this. My portion of it is that your parents have been sent here to torture you. When you go to bed at night, they stay up at, late at night and they th they discuss among themselves ways to make your life miserable. That is the role of parents. Well, you know, it is one of the Ten Commandments to honor, honor your father and your mother. And, and you may say, well, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm not going to steal things. I'm not going to covet my neighbor's wife. But honor your father and mother, that, that's the hardest one. I mean, honestly, it's probably your hardest one uh, to honor your father and mother. Um, and you might be saying, well, you don't know my parents. And I, I probably don't. I, you probably act a little bit different here than you do at home. Um, I mean, we want to be... Um, we want to be people of integrity and be the same all the time, but we're not always. So... I just want to say before I, I talk about this a little more, that if you're in an abusive situation, then God does not want you to be in a, an abusive situation. And there are people that would love to help you, and um, you need to find a trusted adult. Um, but if you're not in an abusive situation, and there may be someone in a crowd this size that maybe you are, so, so please reach out to somebody here. Um, but most of you are not in an abusive uh, situation. And what we need to do when you come to Hope Point and come to church here, we want to find all of our answers for all of life's questions in the Word of God. So there's a great verse in Ephesians that says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That's black and white. This is right. Okay. But, you know, you say, well, why is it right? Well, the next verse says it, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. So it's just God's design for you to honor your parents so that you can enjoy life and they can enjoy life with you. But this is really great because right after those verses, Ephesians 6, 4 talks to the parents and it says, fathers, do not exasperate your children Instead, bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. So you probably say, well, that's the problem in my house because they exasperate me. Um, but if, you know, it's, you can't count these things. Like, they made me put my phone up at night at 9 o'clock in their room. Um, they made me do, it, do the dishwasher and, and they bug me about cleaning my room. And they won't let me go to places I want to go. And they won't me, let me wear what I want to wear. I can remember my daughter's in elementary school. She said, I can't wait to get out of ha this house so mm -hmm. I can wear belly button shirts. Um, I don't know. It was a big deal to show your belly button then. And I said, well, go for it. You can do that <laughs> when you go to college. Um, but you're probably kind of in the same boat as a lot of us. We, I mean, I used to be a kid, too. And I sometimes thought my parents were really 
too strict, and, and they were very strict. And my mom would embarrass me. Um, I remember one time I went up the road to my friend's house and I was, we were talking, I think I was maybe in sixth or seventh grade, and Bert Gunter lived across the street and he was a really cute guy. And we were just, he was out in the yard and we were just like, you know, being really cool and talking to Bert. And my mom rode up the street on my banana seat bicycle, my old one that I had as a kid, to tell me that uh, you need to come home. Because she told me I couldn't go up the street until I cleaned my room, and I didn't. So she totally embarrassed me. And, you know, I was, I was very unhappy with her with that. Um, but uh, I want you to think about how you honor your parents and how you speak to them and it, it's just a commandment from God to honor them. You know, it's weird. It says in the Bible, love your neighbors and love your enemies. It doesn't really say love your parents. It says honor them. So it's a kind of a different special thing. And it's something you're supposed to do your whole life starting now. Um, so what can you do? Let's get practical. You can forgive them because they have sinned against you. And... They have made unwise decisions sometimes, and they sometimes um, have unrealistic expectations of you. Um, I mean, I can remember, no kidding, with my daughter, I don't know how old she was. I'm sure she was about your age. I don't know. We were having just a really pretty heated conversation, and she just made me really, really, really mad, and I had lemonade in my hand, and I just threw it all over her. I was so mad at her. So see, you don't have the worst parent. You don't. Um, I, and Richard, can you remember when one time, I think you threw a phone across the room, did you? That's what they say. Yeah, that's what they say. We, you exasperate us, and we exasperate you, and so we, we sin too, and so hopefully, when your parents sin against you, um, they apologize. And hopefully when you sin against them, you apologize. Um, you need to honor them by speaking well of them and, and not telling your friends how horrible your parents are. Um, you know, in Exodus, it's, there's a verse that says, the penalty for cursing your parents is the same penalty as uh, assaulting them or killing them, and that was death. So, um, I mean, you live in a good time now because I'm sure you have said some rude things about your parents. You know, when you're a little kid, your parents were the best. Like, you wanted to play with them all the time, and, and you wanted to, um, hey, look at this, come play with me, let's do this, oh, let me show you this. They were the most important thing in your life. And now that you're older, it's a natural thing to start to pull away a little bit because it's part of growing up. It's part of you being independent. And when that's happening, there's going to be some clashing. But you still need to honor them. So I want you to try something. Um, I want you to talk to your parents. And I say, no, it's awkward. I don't want to talk to them. It's so awkward. Um, okay, y'all are lucky. Y'all have cell phones. So honestly, you can text your parent this. Hey, we were talking in broadcast about honoring your parents. I haven't been honoring you lately, and I really want that to change in our house. And um, I'm sorry. If you tell them you're sorry for not honoring them, oh my goodness, you just made your parents the happiest people on earth. And they'll probably tell you, that they've sinned against you also. Let me ask you something. How many times a day, or how many minutes in a day do you think about your parents? I would say maybe one minute. I mean, maybe. You have your life. You have school. You have your friends. You have da 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 You really probably don't think about your parents that much. Let me tell you, your parents think about you all the time. They're praying for you. They're worrying about you, even though we're not supposed to worry about you. They're worried about you because they have a big assignment from God. What was that assignment? To bring you up in training and instruction of the Lord. They're going to mess up, but that is their desire for you. And so as you're independent and you're moving out of the house, they, won't, they don't want you to live with them forever, I promise. They want you to move on, and they want you to um, love the Lord and 
That's why there's clashing, because you're becoming independent. But I really want you to try with your family to have a conversation with them and talk about honoring each other. But, but it's, it's a commandment for you to honor your parents. So um, why don't you start doing that? In my day, my mom, um, we didn't have cell phones when I was a teenager. So she would uh, write notes on little index cards and stick them on the bathroom mirror. If there was something hard she needed to tell us or tell me, that's what she would do. And then we could both think about it and then talk about it calmly later. So maybe texting might be a good thing. You can say, hey, let's talk about this later. And then everybody has kind of figured out what they're gonna to say to each other. But I just wanna challenge you. Um, this is something you need to do if you're a follower of Christ to honor your parents. So have a little talk with them and see how y'all can honor each other and love each other and so it's not so yucky in your life and in your home because they don't want it to be that way and it says if it's not that way and you honor your parents you will um, enjoy long life on earth wow you done oh, oh by the way let me say one more thing oh put me back on thank you um I do want to say this real quickly. Uh, God has placed you in the family that you're in. He did that, and he did that for a great reason. Whether you're a biological child or an adopted child, our daughter is adopted, and we were there in the delivery room when she was born, and she has been our child forever. And, and God put her in our family. So don't get mad at God for the family he put you in. He did it for a purpose and for your good and for their good. And I think, uh, I think things could be um, more enjoyable in your family if y'all honor each other and talk about it a little. Okay, thanks. You can take it down, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Reverend Lisa. Am I cuter than Burt Gunter? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lise. Um, I'll make these questions. Um, I'm going to go through these quick because um, I have another, we have another guest uh, with a pretty intense um, question. Um, you ask, uh, what should I read in the Bible to hear God's voice better? Any tips on having a, a good prayer routine? Um, I'll cover this quickly because we sort of do this a lot. Um, if I were you and you're not reading the Bible now, I would pick a short book in the New Testament to give you some confidence. Um, I would like the book of Philippians is four chapters. The book of James is five chapters. The book of First John is five chapters. So Philippians or James um, or First um, John and then, after you get a little confidence, go to the book of Mark. It's only 16 chapters. It reads very quickly. And always, if I, I would say, read the Psalms every day because it will help you feel like, it will help you adore God, which is your purpose of life. And it will also feel like there's somebody that's sympathizing with your suffering because the guy in the Psalms is always in some kind of trouble. So read the Psalms, short books, and then get to the gospel as quickly as you can. When you read the Bible, I tell you, you got to read with a pen, underline, circle, or you underline and circle. And then I would say when I read the Bible and you come across something cool like that Jesus did, like he calmed a storm, just say that, Jesus, that was cool. Interact with the Bible and talk it back to God. How do you have a good prayer life? I don't know. Um, still working on that one, but here's what I would do. I would incorporate every day in your life praise to God for his attributes. God, thank you that you're in control. Thank you for beauty. Thank you for the blessings of my brain and ears. Thank him for that. Thank him for Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Those are things that you can, and then, you know, then the, the first of all, the great prayer is Matthew 6, 9. Lord, may your name be honored in all the earth. Those are just easy things to do every day. God, thank you for who you are. Blessings. Jesus, thank you for the cross. God, may your name be honored in all the earth. And then after that, um, for your prayer life, I would use cards. I'd use prayer cards. 
and start with the people closest to you, like if you're praying for your parents, uh, write their name and how are you going to pray for them. And then, if, then, you know, then, then the next closest person to you. But I wouldn't be too worried about praying for all the people in the world that you don't know until you start with circle, let it grow, let it grow and grow. And so I would use prayer cards to keep your, your prayer life um, intact. In Richard, what was, as a kid, what word knocked you out of the spelling bee? Um, it was the word been, like I have been there. Can everybody, everybody spell that? How many people think you know how to spell the word been? Well, I don't, it seems to be easy to me uh, now, but it was, uh, it was hard then. I spelled it B-E-N-E, B-E-N-E. <laughs> and I still remember the trauma of, you know, you know, sit down. So, um, Lisa, what was yours? Item. All right, her item that knocked, I mean, her word that knocked her out was the word item. How many people know how to spell item? Well, for her, it, it sounded like it had a D in it, I-D-E-M. It does not. It's I-T-E-M, and Ben is B-E-E-N. So those were the words that knocked us out. Um, oh, this, is a, this will be an intense question, uh, and then I'll we'll, we'll bring the other guest up. Uh, where do babies uh, go who die prematurely? Um, I appreciate you asking that. As a pastor, you know, I've done a number of funerals for children, and uh, they are obviously the most difficult. And I always say this, answer a question as if you are having to teach it, um, you know, at a funeral, because you're trying to comfort. What can you say that's true? Here's what, here's what I would say is the truth about you know, the death of a baby. Jesus said, let the children come to me, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So Jesus made a statement about what he's looking for in somebody's heart, in somebody's faith. And what he says wins his heart, entrance into the kingdom, is when somebody comes with no self-reliance. That's, that's the one thing that we know about children, is they are always looking, holding hand out to mom, dad, or whoever. Help me, feed me, clothe me. Help me get to the next thing. Give me a ride in the car. But children do not have this crazy self-reliance that happens when we get to be adults. Hey, I've got it now. I don't need God. Children are, they make a declaration as disabled people would too. I don't have confidence in myself. I need help. So Jesus is very attracted to that. I need help faith. Second thing that I would say would give you confidence about where do children go the sin that God says, the, the deliberate sin in Romans chapter 1 that uh, causes the wrath of God to be poured out is when somebody is willfully rebelling against the known presence of God. That is, they, can, they look at creation and say there's not a God. They, they, they um, uh, can hear God in their conscience, you know, right and wrong type thing, and say there is no God. So it is willful rebellion against the clear witness of God is what creates the wrath of God. And children obviously do not have the capacity, babies in the womb do not have the capacity to rebel against the clear witness of God. Now, uh, um, Levi, uh, Marlo, I would appreciate if you'd come up. Levi is one of our officers who... Um, uh, serves us on Sunday morning, and the question is a little bit broader than that, but helping a friend who is uh, in a suicidal uh, um, situation, Levi is going to speak a little bit to his own journey uh, with uh, um, suicidal thoughts, but I will tell you this, um, when a friend comes to you and says to you, I have something to share with you, um, Levi, you can come here, it's fine. When, 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 I, I, when a friend says, I have something to share with you, you promise you can't tell anyone, you don't ever make that promise. Because if they tell you something that, is, that it has great potential harm, you have to tell someone. So when somebody, don't, don't answer that. I'm, and then if somebody tells you that they are suicidal, you would need to ask the question such as, you know, how long have you been thinking about this? And uh, do you have a plan? Um, and so... Can I, would you allow me to call an adult, a counselor, to help you? So that answers that question. Levi may have something more to say, but I want him to just address the issue of what happens when the, when the sensation, the temptation of suicide, maybe in, in your life or your thinking, arises. Thank you, Richard. 
Absolutely. Talk about it. Ask them. A lot of people shy away from asking questions of have you had a plan. They, people automatically think that's a bad thing, like you're going to give them ideas. Um, it's not true. Ask. Um, honestly, most of the time, that's all they ever want anyway is somebody to ask. Um, that's probably part of the reason that they've got to the point of thinking about suicide is because nobody ever asks them anything. Nobody asks if they're okay. Um, so always ask. Talk to your friends. Don't be afraid to say, hey, are you depressed? Just say it outright. Um, obviously, um, I work for the sheriff's office. <clears throat> I am in the special victims unit, so I, I deal with crimes against children, whether that's physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, suicidal ideation, um, anything like that, runaways. Um, they're kind of what Richard was talking about earlier with kind of everything has a plan. Um, looking back over my life, I never would have imagined that I would be honestly here in this church, but sitting back there thinking about it, everything that I can think about in my life has led me to be here today just to be able to tell you about something that happened 15 years ago. Um, when I was 16 or 17, um, I was very mad at the world. Um, most of my teenage years, I hated everybody. I hated everybody, I hated everything, I hated myself, I hated my family. Um, the, the friends that I had uh, were not really that great of friends. Um, they really didn't care either. Um, I had got to the point where I just didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to live. There was no joy in the world at all for me. Um, my parents went out of town. Uh, my brother had, was much older. He had married off and, and had his own house with his family. My parents were out of town. I was 16 or 17 years old. They were out of town for the weekend. Um, and I found myself driving south on 85 at about 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. Um, didn't know where I was going, didn't know what I was doing, um, but it wasn't a good thing. Uh, about halfway to Atlanta, um, I saw an opportunity with a transfer trailer, um, put his blinker on to get over into the, to the most right-hand lane. I turned my lights off, floored it, and got in beside him um, on, on top of a bridge, hoping that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the opportunity or the chance and it would be taken care of for me and I would get pushed off the bridge. Um, as much as I tried, my car continued to move over and would not hit his truck. Um, before I knew it, we were off the bridge and I, st I still couldn't, nothing was working and, and I kept getting pushed over and I remember trying to turn into the transfer trailer as hard as I could and I'm I may not be as fit as I used to be, but I used to be pretty fit, and I was trying with all of my might to turn into this transfer trailer. No matter how hard I pulled my steering wheel, it would not move. Um, I kept moving over into the emergency lane, emergency lane and then I, I guess he saw me and, and swerved back over. Um, I immediately pulled over, and um, that's when my phone rang, and it was my dad's mom, my grandmother, probably the most godly woman that I've ever met in my life and will ever meet. Um, and again, it's midnight at this point, maybe 1230, 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, she's old. She goes to bed at about 839. So she calls me at 1 o'clock in the morning and says, hey, um, I, I just woke up and I just I felt like I needed to call you and see if you were OK. Um, and she asked me if everything was OK. Um, I told her yes, uh, but she said, uh, I think I need to pray with you. And she prayed with me on the phone that night. Super short, I can't even remember what she said. I was so out of it. Um, but directly after that phone call, I heard, not in the car with me, but in my head, I heard it very clear, you're not done. Um, that next morning, I drove home, um, long drive home, um, a lot of crying, a lot of screaming, a lot of cussing at the windshield, um, a lot of very loud music. <laughs> um, but that night I got home, I went to bed, and I woke up the next morning and I made a decision. I was done. Um, I, I didn't want to be mad anymore. I didn't want to be angry. I hated my life. I, I hated who I was. But I realized that it wasn't that it wasn't that I wanted to leave the world. It was that I wanted it to be different. Um, and I wanted, I wanted things to change. And from that moment on, I made a choice. 
And like he said earlier, I literally had to tell myself every single morning and make it a, a very direct comment to myself to make the choice, today I'm not going to be angry. If I get angry, I'm going to stop. I'm going to make myself stop whatever I'm doing. And my way of, of getting out of that was to pray. I would pray and, and find five things to, to pray and find five things to thank God that, that I had, no matter what it was. At the moment, I had a job. So a lot of people don't have a job. Even if it was minute, even if it was small things, I found five little things to be able to say that I'm, I'm thankful for this, that I'm glad that I have this. And, and that helped me snap out of getting into the habit of just being angry and, and just being mad and just being just depressed. Um, knowing me wrong, it was probably a good two years um, before I really came out of that. Um, and then after that, I still struggled with, with anger issues um, in the following years after that. But it was a long process, but it was one of those, it was a process that you had to make, and you had to make that decision, you had to make it right then, and you had to make it where there weren't any more options. This is what I'm going to do. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna waver from this. So for two years straight, every single time that I got angry, I made myself stop. No matter what I was doing, I made myself stop and pray and thank God for five things, no matter what it was. Um, out of that suicidal thoughts and ideation, that all stemmed from something else that you guys had talked about with your parents. Um, growing up, let me first say that I, I absolutely love and adore my parents. Both my mom and my dad, they both loved me. Um, they definitely had their faults. Um, up until my dad passed away a couple of years ago, we had a very, very good relationship by the time he passed away. Um, it was the best it had ever been, and I couldn't ask for any more. Um, but growing up, it wasn't that way. Um, my mom struggled with drug addiction when I was very young, um, five, six, seven, eight years old. Um, we lost a lot of things through that. Um, drug addiction is financially an issue as well as physically and emotionally and, and all the other things. Um, my dad had anger issues that didn't help um, that, that mom was dealing with that. Um, through all of that, my dad worked from sun up to sundown trying to provide for us because he did love us, but his dad wasn't the best at showing love and affection and that he was proud. Um, and my dad struggled with anger issues. So I saw um, a lot of domestic violence. Sadly, probably the, one of the most vivid memories I have of my home life um, when I was younger was hearing, sounded like a stampede in, in the living room and I jumped out of bed and took off down the hall to see my dad on top of my mom and the floor holding her down. Um, I, I don't know what they were arguing about. Chances are it was money at the time, um, but that was one of the most vivid memories I have of my childhood. And I'm, I'm 30, and that's what sticks in my mind. And that's rough. It, 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 it's bad. Um, I have good memories, but things like that is what kind of helped lead me to the road of, of suicidal ideation. But seeing those things, having some of the physical abuse on me um, with my dad's anger issues, suicidal ideation, all of those things ended up leading me to what I do now. Um, I weekly have a case where I can relate to a, to a kid that, that's going through something um, because it's not, it's not rare. Um, after taking this job and, and getting into this profession and, and working these cases, um, I've realized that it's not rare at all. Um, there's probably, I don't know, 70, 80 of y'all in here. So statistically, there's somewhere around 10 of you that's being, that's most likely been physically abused or neglected. Um, a handful of you will have at least had suicidal ideations by now. Um, probably one of two of you may have even um, attempted. It's not rare, it's everywhere. All the time, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, who your parents are, it's everywhere. Um, and the fact is, is it happens. The trick is, come tell us, tell somebody. It's okay to tell somebody. It's not a problem that you have this, it's a problem that we can't help you. 
we want to help you. There are so many resources. There are so many people that love you and care about you and, and care who you are that want to make sure that you're okay. We have, forget the worldly fathers, we have the absolute best father that anybody can ever imagine who set the best example for all of us. No father wants their child to suffer. Okay? So there are resources, there are people that want to help you. We want to help you. I want to help you. Even if it's just to talk to, come tell somebody. Um, thank you, Levi. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I want to say, um, you know, thank you to Lisa, thank you to Levi, um, and um, I want to honor your time, and uh, you guys have had a lot, so I won't, I'm not going to answer any more questions um, tonight, and um, <clears throat> uh, other than this last one, and um, I think that it will be a great one to end on. Uh, the, I'm, not, I'm not even going to show it on the on the screen. It just the question was um, uh, because of my stress and depression, uh, anxiety, I've drifted from the Lord, and um, I don't even know if I can reconnect with Him again. I don't know. I've been. I've, I'm so stressed. I don't know if I can reconnect with God again. So my answer for that was this. Um, the only way to come back to God, and I'm so glad Levi just shared, the only way to come back to God is to come with what you have. God doesn't ask you to bring what you don't have. He asks you to bring what you do have, what's left. And my example of that would be the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, ran away from home, um, wasted his father, spent all of his father's money, um, lived a wild life, eventually found himself eating with... Um, and living with uh, pigs, uh, and so smelly, dirty, and broke, and ashamed, he wrote a speech or developed a speech of what he was going to say to his father to ask his father's forgiveness. So he had this, you can read this in Luke 15, he had it made up, what I'm going to say to my father, please let me back. And when he came to his father, remember this kid was living with pigs, dirty, really messed up life, the first thing his father did was to hug him. And when the son started rehearsing the speech that he had made of how he was needed to come back, his father stopped him mid-sentence and did not even let his son finish shaming himself. Because the father interrupted him to say, hey, uh, we need to throw a party here because my son who was dead is now alive. My son who was lost has now been found. So how do you come back to God after you've, you know, left him with depression, anxiety, and maybe have dabbled with some sin? Uh, you know, what if you're part of the LGBTQ community and you've dabbled with that? Or what if you've dabbled with, you know, heterosexual sin? How do, whatever the stress has produced in your life of departing from God, how do you come back? Like the prodigal son, smelly and dirty and bankrupt, and, and you just start your speech, and God will stop you midstream and says, let me hug you and come back home. Let's pray. Father, I, um, <clears throat> I thank you for these students. Um, oh, God, thank you for the, the two weeks we've been together to just admit that it's pretty stressful. Father, we need you. Father, I pray for these dear hearts, these young men and women. Um, Father, I pray for those who have dabbled in sexual sin. I pray for those who right now are addicted um, to impure images on their computer or phone. I pray for those who are very stressed out at home and maybe don't even, don't even have a support system with their parents or they've forgotten how to appreciate it. Lord, I pray for those who are, are so hopeless. Um, they, they, they think about not wanting to live. Father, I pray for these students that the Spirit of God would come and use the Scripture in prayer and singing. Lord, just to remind them to not believe the lie. There is hope. There is a Levi riding down the interstate angry. There's a Levi that's now a law enforcement officer. There is a, there's a new person out there in the future for them. Jesus, you died 
so we could be new. You're, you died so we could, we could have our mistakes forgiven. Jesus, 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 speak to these students. Tell them how much, remind them how much you love them. Father, we pray for the LGBT community that you can save them, you can cleanse them. Father, may they come to the truth. May they come to Christ. Father, make us good witnesses. Lord, living it out. Lord, free us from that which is false in our life. Cleanse us, cleanse us, cleanse us by Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, we've never needed you more. Father, we don't know how to read our Bible. We don't know how to pray. We don't know how to love you. Put love in our heart, Lord, for you. Put love in our heart for others. Oh, Father, may the Holy Spirit bless this student ministry as never before. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.